everybody, welcome to our webinar series, Cultivating Critical Language Awareness in TESO, hosted by the BMAS, Bilingual Multilingual Education Interest Section at TESO International Association. My name is Zhong Feng Tian, the current chair of the BMAS. I'm really excited to host the, today's webinar. And our chair-elect, Nashia, from the University of Auckland, is also here with us today. Do you want to say a quick hi? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'm joining in from New Zealand. So to give you a bit more information about our interest section, we aim to support and promote all multilingual learners, linguistic repertoires, and multiliteracy skills as fundamental to the acquisition of a second or additional language. We believe that additive and dynamic approaches must be endorsed and implemented in educational institutions in the interests of students from diverse backgrounds. We support the opportunity and the right of all individuals to develop, construct, and maintain a diverse range of cultural, linguistic, and literate, literate repertoires of practice. And we wor work to foster collaborative relations of power and address inequitable power relations in society and empower minority students to use their own repertoires of practice. So why cultivating critical language awareness in TESO? First, the landscape and profession of TESO has been constantly evolving. And increasing attention has been paid to recognizing the linguistic diversity of world Englishes, moving away from the so-called native versus non-native dichotomy and questioning structuralist ideologies of language standardization. In TESO teaching and learning, we see the need for more humanizing practices that value multilingual learners' local realities and funds of knowledge and bring in voices and representation of racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse communities. Coupled with the evolving TESO landscape is a rapidly changing world, further complicating the backdrop of English teaching and learning with a series of social and political events such as the COVID-19 pandemic, racial justice movements, and global migration and refugee crisis. Faced with the evolving TESO landscape situated in today's changing world, we believe that it is more important than ever to cultivate space for criticality and critical perspectives in TESO as a means to fight for social, racial, and linguistic justice. So therefore, we organized this webinar series Cultivating Critical Language Awareness in TESO, which features three emerging and early career scholars work with one webinar per month from January to March. Each webinar will be recorded and will last 60 minutes. Please keep your mic muted during the presentation and turn off web cameras. If you have a question or comment, we invite you to enter it in the chat during the presentation and the presenter will address your question at the end. All participants in today's event will have access to the recorded version, which will be available within one week after the live event. So now, without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, speaker of this webinar series, Dr. Anna Mendoza. Dr. Anna Mendoza is a assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, USA. Her research interests include bi- and multilingualism in K-12 education, use of students' other languages in English medium instruction, classroom discourse analysis, and critical applied linguistics. The title of her talk today is Critical Language Awareness in the TESOL Classroom. What is it and what does it accomplish? Anna, the floor is yours. Hey, let me uh, try to hopefully it was working like did earlier. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Is it good, Zhongfeng? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for um, coming to support my presentation today. And I also want to thank Zhongfeng and Nasha for this um, this um, excellent and um, you know re actually a very great privilege to be able to address an audience on on such a platform 
I honestly um, must admit that this is my first talk of this um, with this size audience in my academic career. So honestly, um, I'm a little bit nervous, um, but uh, here goes. So uh, I will put my timer on for the maximum of uh, 30 to 40 minutes. I think it should be around 35 minutes. Um, so uh, as you know, I'm Dr. Anna Mendoza. I'm an assistant professor of sociolinguistics and TESOL at uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, in the Department of Linguistics. And um, in this presentation, I'm going to follow the outline that uh, I was uh, given. Um, so uh, I will first define critical language awareness and talk about why it matters to TESOL. And uh, I've chosen that first question to take up the bulk of the presentation, um, to be the, the crux or the central part of the discussion. Um, what is it and why does it matter? Um, I think that might be useful as I'm the first speaker in this series. And then in the last 10 minutes of the presentation, I'm going to talk about um, from a personal perspective, what's brought me to this work, how my research and teaching addresses uh, critical language awareness in TESOL, and how we can engage in the work moving forward, including any recommended resources. So um, without further ado, I will first try to define critical language awareness. So um, in my view, critical language awareness is uh, an awareness about language use that leads to interactional choices to fully involve every person in the class's learning processes and equitably restructure social relations. So when I think about awareness of language use, uh, I mean awareness of uh, firstly language use in society, so um, language ideologies in society, language norms in society, and then contrasting that with the language choices we're making in the moment in the classroom um, and how uh, people um, play those two things or those two factors off of one another. And uh, there are several studies that I'm going to talk about briefly um, to give some concrete examples of this abstract definition. Um, they're from different parts of the world. So this slide is my whole lit review, my whole literature review. So if you, um, at first you will think, oh, they're from different parts of the world, they're from different levels of education, but the similarities between them will become apparent shortly. So in the first study by Elaine Allard and colleagues, uh, they studied a high school ESL class in Pennsylvania where the majority first language was Spanish, but a minority of students uh, spoke other home languages apart from Spanish. So um, the question arose, right, as to what to do with Spanish in the class if it was useful for a good majority of students but would exclude others. And the question that arose was how Spanish could be used alongside English in this ESL class to maximize inclusivity for all students. In the second study, uh, Ingrid Beiler looked at three grade 11 English classes in Norway taught by the same teacher. Um, and in these three grade 11 English classes, they were streamed at different levels. There was an advanced class, a regular class, and a remedial class. And the remedial class was smaller than the other two, and it also had the most immigrant students. So students not only learning English, but learning Norwegian as an additional language. And Beiler found that in the regular and advanced classes, the teacher discouraged translanguaging uh, and implemented a, an English-only policy. Um, but he encouraged translanguaging in the remedial class where uh, the most immigrant students were to encourage them to practice Norwegian as well as English um, and socialize them into using both languages. Moreover, immigrant students in the remedial class perceived translanguaging in languages other than English and Norwegian as antisocial or talking behind others' backs. In the third study by Charalambos, Charalambos, and Zembailas in Cyprus, um, they looked at an elementary school in Cyprus, which is uh, the Greek side of Cyprus. So Cyprus has been divided into uh, Greek and Turkish sides since the 1970s. And at the school, it was the Greek side of Cyprus, and kids who spoke Turkish 
uh, came from many different countries, and they had complex migration histories. But these children uh, feared speaking Turkish, even if they weren't necessarily from the Turkish side of Cyprus, because it was constructed as the language of the enemy. And even when the teacher encouraged them to use Turkish as a resource in their learning to translate things or to show what they knew in another language, they uh, didn't want to do it. Some of them even went so far as to have different names for home and school, calling themselves Emil at home and Mehmet, uh, sorry, calling themselves Emil, a Greek name at school, and Mehmet, the real name at home. In the fourth study, um, Patricia Duff studied a high school social studies class in Vancouver, Canada, my hometown. Uh, in this class, the English monolingual teachers were not used to teaching students whose first language was not English. So when the teachers explained uh, the academic texts, the academic uh, history texts, interaction patterns involved uh, deconstructing the texts in everyday colloquial and vernacular English with many pop culture references, which was helpful and engaging for the students whose first language was English, but students whose second language language was English struggled just as much, if not more, with a vernacular and colloquial English spoken in fast oral speech that was used to deconstruct the texts uh, as much as they did with the academic English. And so, again, just like all the other examples, we are thinking about how we can engage uh, our language use in class, how we can shift or change our language use by being aware of how language ideologies that circulate in the wider society are impacting the language practices in class and the language choices we're making in that moment. So for example, what does it mean to speak Turkish? What does it mean to speak languages other than Norwegian and English? What does it mean to exclude non-English languages? And then what other choices can we make to fully involve every person in the class's learning processes and restructure social relations in the class and the wider society? In the last two studies, Rajendram looked at an elementary English class in Malaysia where all the students were Tamil, Malay, and English trilinguals. She found that the students from white collar backgrounds who were more English proficient, but also less proficient in the other two languages, discouraged their more bi and multilingual peers from translanguaging. Now, these students from working class backgrounds who are more bi and multilingual in English, Tamil, and Malay were thus not able to bring all their language resources to bear on learning. And furthermore, furthermore all the students were reluctant to use Malay to translanguage because they perceived themselves as deficient Malay speakers. They were Tamil kids growing up in Malaysia, and their Malay was seen as deviant, inferior, and influenced by Tamil. In the last study, Sa and Lee looked at a secondary English medium instruction class in Nepal, and they found that translanguaging to learn was common between Nepali and English, which uh, was the national language and English, but teachers and students avoided bringing their other first languages to bear on learning, including Gurum, Limbu, and Newari, which are indigenous, regional, and tribal languages. So you can see the common theme running through all these studies in different parts of the world in primary and secondary education. We are seeing three kinds of hegemonies. Languages minoritized or oppressed in that society, languages invisible or disregarded in that class, and disparaged ways of speaking. So how you speak your second language, how you speak your heritage language, or how you speak your first language with a stigmatized dialect. So let me explore these three hegemonies and their common effects um, from the reading and study I've been doing in this area for the past five or six years. And uh, for language hegemonies in society, um, it's quite obvious in the, in the research that people avoid speaking other languages except the societally dominant languages at school, especially when it comes to academic meaning making. So they may do it during recess or in backstage classroom interactions, but not in the front stage academic meaning making. And then there are language hegemonies in the class. So students from the majority non-English language group uh, might make fun of classroom language minorities English in the classroom majority non-English language. So what this means is that if you have a Spanish or a Filipino majority, they can make fun of other students' English 
uh, in Spanish or Filipino. So uh, the classroom language minority will hear talk in this language that's potentially about them and in turn promote an English only policy, which of course deprives their peers from using their first language uh, and bringing it to bear on learning. And then you have language hegemonies that have to do with native speakerism. So this often happens within the same ethno-linguistic group. Uh, students compare themselves to each other. So English dominant people uh, make fun of newcomers' ways of speaking the societally dominant language. So, for example, in the UK, if there are um, students um, of Indian background who have grown up in the UK, they may make fun of the accents of newly arrived uh, peers from India. In turn, the newcomers uh, feel bad, so they make the English dominant long timers feel bad about the ways they speak their heritage languages. So, what you're seeing here are uh, negative feedback loops. Um, the classroom discourse analyst Ben Rampton talked about uh, the construct of feedback loops, uh, and I find this construct very useful in my very useful in my analyses of classroom discourse. Um, it's the idea that uh, because I make you feel bad about your ways of speaking, then you'll get defensive, and then you'll assert your strengths and other ways of speaking, and then you might uh, make me feel bad about my ways of speaking. Um, as you uh, try to obtain a more positive identity position. Or because I dominate with my language in the classroom, then you're going to want to take that language away from me, even though it's an important tool for my learning, right? Um, and so what we need to do, um, obviously, is to mitigate uh, these types of hegemonies. And for me, it's not just about promoting other languages in the class apart from English, but taking into account and seeing what it is that people do when all these languages are brought to bear um, in the class's social life. What do we need to do to create a welcoming, inclusive, and safe space for one another? And I found that this challenge uh, was addressed in 2001 by an education scholar named Christian Faltis in a book called Joint Fostering. And in this book, Faltis talked about five principles for effective teaching in multilingual classrooms. So uh, those were active participation of all students, uh, everyone socially integrated to foster active participation. Oh, pardon me, I think I, I lost my slide there. Just give me a second. Yeah, so he talked about these five principles, active participation of all students, everyone is socially integrated to foster active participation, and language learning is deliberately integrated into content activities. And those are three principles that I've found to be less controversial. Very few teachers would disagree with those. Actually, I don't think any teachers would, would disagree with those. But the more controversial principles are things that I find in the literature and in my own ethnography is that relatively few teachers do. So relatively few teachers involve family and community as partners in learning and see their uh, language and literacy practices as from an aspect based perspective rather than a deficit based perspective so seeing their funds of cultural knowledge as um, useful resources to help them learn the target language uh, and content at school rather than seeing these as hindrances or barriers and few teachers would actually engage in critical language awareness and consciousness raising which is having critical discussions about language inequalities in in society Right, which can get awkward, but which I think are essential. So I arranged Faltis's principles in this gamut. And I note that all teachers actively support principles one to three, but few actively support principles four to five. And then I wonder, are all students going to fully involve themselves and each other in activities one to three, using their whole language repertoires, including languages minoritized in that society, languages minoritized in the class, or minoritized ways of speaking languages, like dialectal user, second language user, heritage language user? So obviously no, right? Unless principles four and five are implemented. If you do them, I think students will take part in principles one to three differently. So I've talked about these types of hegemonies and um, how they might be addressed by principles four and five, right? So if uh, 
teachers implemented the fourth principle, right? Placing all languages on the same footing by decorating the classroom walls in all students' languages, having class projects with all the languages, making students learn phrases in each other's languages. If teachers elicited and learned about class minority languages and cultures, and if teachers translanguaged between all their languages, including um, indigenous, tribal, regional, ethnic minority languages, stigmatized dialects, and invited students to do the same, and then at the same time, if teachers had critical discussions about linguistic discrimination in their society and the global hegemony of English and how certain languages, dialects and culture specific literacy practices are not seen as intellectually valid ways of inquiry. And they had critical discussions about native speaker discrimination or native speaker standards in all languages, in all languages that students speak. Um, I think that it would um, get more student buy-in for principles one to three okay i think the result would be the active participation of all students principle one because then if you do this the students at the periphery of the class the linguistic and cultural periphery would be less likely to disengage because they see teachers making an effort and framing their funds of knowledge in a positive way and then everyone would be socially integrated to foster active participation that's principle two because the students with more linguistic, cultural, and social capital would realize this and would realize their responsibility to include everybody. And then if the students with more capital include the students at the periphery and the students at the periphery don't disengage, and it's easier and more pleasurable for the students at the center to include them, then you get positive feedback loops. So. Uh, I think what I get from joint fostering is the practical implementation of critical language awareness. The practical implementation of critical language awareness is for the teacher to cause shifts in the framing of the context, which in this case is a classroom. So Gumperts and Cook Gumperts have done work on the sociolinguistic construct of framing. And I'll explain it briefly here as the way a picture frame works, right? So if you choose like a brass frame for your picture or a wood frame or an invisible or clear frame, it impacts the way you see the object, right? The way you see the picture. And that's basically the sociolinguistic construct of framing. Uh, framing theory is a theory about social interaction that says we can use language choices to frame the social situation in a range of ways and potentially opposite ways. So is the main immigrants groups language framed as welcome and normal or oh, we're overrun by it? Are classroom minority languages framed as relevant or irre irrelevant, even though few class members speak them? Are dialects and regional languages framed as academically useful or non-academic? Is second language or heritage language output framed as legitimate or laughable? And if you frame them in the right way, I think you'll get more students on board with principles one to three. Uh, I have said in my forthcoming book, the more socially, emotionally, linguistically, culturally, and academically secure class members feel, the more inclusive and equitable their small culture becomes, and the more widely distributed the effects of this magic. So uh, reaching the middle of my presentation, how I define critical language awareness and uh, why it matters to TESOL. So I've defined it as an awareness of language use, right, in the wider society and in the classroom that uh, leads to interactional choices, um, decisions that um, fully involve everyone in the learning community, in the learning processes, and equitably restructure social relations. And I will say it matters to TESOL because even though Critical language awareness involves all class participants. It's the teacher, right? The T in TESOL stands for teaching, who outlines the norms of the classroom. It's the teacher who outlines the norms of the classroom. So it's the teacher who um, says, we are going to develop language awareness in this classroom, which um, Clark, Fairclough, Ivanich, and Martin Jones define as, as awareness of how language practices shape and are shaped by social relationships and relationships of power. And I like this quote from Kumara Vadivalu, language teachers cannot hope to fully satisfy their pedagogic obligations without at the same time satisfying their social obligations.
is the teacher who has to satisfy social obligations to students, um, to recognize how language practices shape and are shaped by social relationships and relationships of power, and then make students uh, realize their social obligations to each other that need to be met before the classroom becomes an educational space for all of them. So uh, I hope you can see um, uh, some empirical evidence of, of this at work. So I'm going to share with you um, some data from my uh, from one of my studies in Hawaii. So the data comes from the classroom of Juan, a ninth grade English teacher, who I think had a, a joint fostering classroom culture. And as I present this data, I'd like you to consider how is Juan aware of language ideologies in society and how does he use classroom language interaction uh, and interactional choices to reframe these ideologies. So uh, Juan uh, was the teacher of a ninth grade English class in Honolulu, Hawaii in May, 2019. He was an Ilocano Filipino English trilingual um, and he had 14 students. The class majority were Ilocano first language speakers. And in this uh, excerpt, which is in May, um, towards the end of the school year, they're actually wrapping up a project, which is a self-published multi-class poetry anthology. So it's the end of the school year. It's the it's a, it's in late May 2019, and they're preparing for the launch of a self-published multi-class poetry anthology. Or it could be early May. Um, anyway, the end of the school year. Um, and six minutes and uh, 20 seconds into the morning class, Juan says, uh, he's talking about the upcoming field trip, the book launch at the Honolulu Library, and he says, fill out a form how many of your family and friends are coming. And then Juan says, fill up the back, how many family and friends are coming? And He, a Cantonese boy who largely grew up in Hawaii, said, how about no one's coming? And this makes Juan get taken aback. There's a two-second pause, and then he says, guys, you Publishing a book is a really big achievement, and there's a lot of things that you do not know that is happening on these days yet, so please encourage your family to come. Two students at the same time. They have work. They're busy. Juan, ha? Huh? Huh. Yeah, student repeats. They're busy. Juan, if they're busy, still encourage them to come. And then a girl laughs as if this is funny, and Juan says, we really hope that there will be parents there because you know what's happening on Wednesday? Students, no, no. Juan, you're going to Honolulu Hale, right? Students, mm-hmm, yeah, Juan. And they're giving you folks an award. And there are gasps. Kix, who's a Ilocano boy, recently arrived in the US and very academically strong. He says, oh my. And Fetu, a Samoan boy, says, what? And Kix says, a ribbon? And Juan says, they're giving a certificate for publishing this book. And Fetu says, why didn't you tell us that already? And Juan says, because I wanted to keep it a surprise. But then, hello, just act surprised when it happens. Students laugh. Fetu, ha, Mr. Juan told us. Juan, and on May 16th, you may receive another award from the state of Hawaii. Two minutes later, Juan, how is this experience making you feel so far? Nothing? Huh, I don't know, nervous, Betu, excited. Juan, what other emotions are happening right now? Is anyone scared? And Betu says, I'm not scared, we'll leave. And Kix says, I'm, not, I'm scared that some people won't like the poem. And Juan says, you know what? People will not like everything we do, but there will be people who like it too. Did I show you the email from Leila Hua High School? And then he brings this email up on the projector and he has students read it aloud together with him in chorus. And then the, the email says, Aloha. I saw the news story about the debut of the book Voice, Poetry by the Youth of Kalihi, and I am so impressed by the students and the work that you and your colleagues have done to build a curriculum that improves their English language proficiency, builds their confidence, and gives them a voice to speak. As an EL teacher at Leilahua High School, I understand the challenges students face socially and academically. In addition, I am familiar with the challenges teachers face to help them overcome obstacles that are overwhelming. We watch the news story with our students and they are impressed by the maturity and courage of your students. Some even mentioned that they felt connected to the experiences and emotions that were shared. Please extend my congratulations to your students and best wishes for a successful book launch. And so, uh, her, the Cantonese boy, uh, or sorry, Juan, he shares the letter from another school's teacher, which we've just seen, and has the students read it aloud with him. Then he asks students again what they feel. And Fetu says he feels happy because some of the students at the other school said they were connected to their poems. 
And Juan says it took 20 to 25 years to feature a book by ELL students. And Kik says, wow. And then Juan says, when will this become real for you? That's eight minutes and 25 seconds in. And then 20 seconds later, Juan says, now, this is where I need your math skills because we're going to track down how many books we've sold so far. He says, okay, tell me, I got you the answer. Juan, so He is doing the math right now. And a few minutes pass and He counts how many books they've sold. Kix is trying to count along too. And He comes up with the right answer and says to Kix, you forgot the 11 at the back. And Juan says, this package is from my friend, Miss Hendricks. She teaches here at their school and she bought five copies for her family in Colorado. And she gave me her package because she wants you folks to sign the pages because she's giving this as a present, okay? And he tells them to sign their bios and they start passing around the five copies that Miss Hendricks bought. And, and they're taking turns autographing all the copies. And meanwhile, He finishes counting the number of copies sold. And Juan says, how many copies did we sell? And Fetu says, 188. And Juan, in this emotional voice, says, folks, we've sold 188 copies of the book. And students say, yay, wow. And there's applause. And that was 654 copies sold by the National Council of Teachers of English Conference that fall. And then, uh, 15 minutes later, Juan says, okay, let's relate this back to what we are learning in this class. <clears throat> are we successful? He says, yes. Kick says, yes. Juan says, in taking the role of a writer, because we learned about writers, right? Writers have a, what is the P word? They have a, they have an author's, one student, then another says purpose. They have an author's purpose. Okay. And they have an A. What is that A word? Not the bad word. Students laugh. What do you call that? They have a purpose for their awe. And Fetu says, audience, audience, right? And Juan says, are we successful in achieving that? And students chorus, yes. And that's 100% related to official curricular aims to learn about purpose and audience and so on. And Juan says, how do we know we're successful in achieving an author's purpose for our audience? And Kik says, because our purpose was to write um, our poems to make people read it. And people are already emailing and buying the book. And Juan says, okay, people are already emailing us that they're getting, they're connected to the experiences and they're buying the book. What else? Five second pause. Anything else? How do we know we're successful in achieving this purpose? And Yupia, who's an Ilocano girl says, uh, the emails that they're sending to us. And Juan says, the emails that people are sending to us. Right, what kind of people have we touched so far? And Yupia says, like the highest. And He says, like authors. Um, Juan says, authors. And He says, um, editors. And Juan says, okay, editors. Kix says, teachers. And Juan says, teachers, Aliyah. Uh, an Ilocano girl who uh, grew up in Hawaii says superintendent and Juan says the superintendent sent us an email too and Kik says the um, doctor, doctor, the one from uh, Juan, the board of ed, right, Dr. H, who's a professor of education. Okay, you feel principal, Juan. Students too, right? And Fetu, the Samoan boy, says, yep, you feel a principal, fun, principals, vice principals are coming on our event, teachers are coming. So what does it say about the project? And He says it's successful, and Fon says it is successful so far. And someone drums rapidly on the table and He says, drum roll. And Juan says, honestly, all of us are overwhelmed because you guys don't see a lot of the things that are happening, but we wish that you folks are more involved too, but it's going really crazy. It's going really big. So I hope it's starting to become more realistic as we approach our field trips. And then again, he starts talking about the logistics of the field trip. So I hope you can see how the field trip was initially framed by the students uh, based on common sense and um, what sociologist Pierre Bourdieu would call habitus, uh, the default framing of the situation that's given their prior experiences, given what they know about the world. But then Juan reframes it uh, both through his classroom language use and through his actions, um, through the discourses he's bringing in, through evidence that he's marshalling and providing. And so these, I think, are principles four and five at work. So uh, I've spent most of the talk um, just addressing um, the first question. So I said I would spend the last 10 minutes talking a bit about uh, uh, myself and uh, how my research and teaching has addressed CLA in TESOL, as well as any recommended ways to move forward and recommended resources. So um, 
I do believe that teachers need to lead the class to reframe these default discourses um, as, again, to fully involve everyone in the classroom's learning processes and restructure social relations. And of course, they need to collaborate with one another. So uh, there needs to be relationships built up between teachers as well. And so what's brought me to this work is um, what I've realized about teachers and teaching and the relationships teachers also need to have with one another. And I think the more teachers themselves are labeled from a deficit rather than asset-based perspective, a uh, second language English speaker, monolingual English speaker who doesn't have much multilingual or multicultural knowledge, a uh, person from a working class background who doesn't belong in the academy, intellectual with no life skills. I, I've purposely picked um, opposite things here because no matter where you are, you you someone can say something negative about you, right? We all have vulnerabilities. Uh, not to mention teachers being outsiders to educational and applied linguistics theories. How can they emancipate students to take on new possible identities if they themselves cannot grapple with and transcend their own vulnerabilities and negative identity positionings in bi and multilingual education research and societal discourses? Anxiety and defensiveness on the part of one classroom participant breeds more anxiety and defensiveness on the part of others, especially if they are coming from the teacher as the head of the class. So that's a quote from my upcoming book. And I think that's what really uh, has brought me to this work, what drives me um, to carry on with it. And uh, in terms of how my research and teaching has addressed uh, critical language awareness in TESOL, um, I would say that my research argues and illustrates that critical language awareness is a process that requires the cooperation of all classroom participants, but it's led by the teacher. So my goal is to show how teachers uh, show teachers through empirical research, uh, like what I've just shared with you, is that they need to define uh, one of their primary roles as shaper of the classroom environment so that everyone fully engages in joint fostering and manages their classroom talk and the ways in which they construct their identities through this talk in ways that are sensitive to the emergent and socially constructed identities of others. Uh, so teachers are also responsible for giving each other positive feedback loops, right? The more I position you as something positive or negative, the more you'll position me as more of the same thing, uh, positive or negative based on how I've positioned you. And so we have to be very careful with how we position each other. And how to engage in this work moving forward. I want to conclude with us with this sentence of going beyond teaching methods and strategies that we talk about quite frequently and thinking about the social relations, uh, instead thinking about the social relations we need to foster to fully achieve our learning aims. Uh, but by learning aims, of course, we don't just mean what's in the official curriculum. And uh, these would be my recommended resources for critical language awareness, top three book picks. There's Negotiating Language Policies in Schools, Educators as Policymakers, a collection of studies by Kate, edited by Kate Menken and Ophelia Garcia, which was uh, reviewed very positively by Jim Cummins, who himself wrote a great book that's on my shelf over here. It's called Language, Power, and Pedagogy, Bilingual Children in the Crossfire. And my top one books, Right now that I've just talked about Christian Faltis's Join Fostering Teaching and Learning in Multilingual Classrooms. Uh, I also recommend Voice Poetry by the Youth of Kalihi, which uh, was the poetry anthology that was discussed in the empirical data that I presented in this presentation. Please uh, consider buying it, ordering it on Amazon. It would also be excellent if you're teaching uh, language arts or ESL courses to high school English language learners, especially um, in an English dominant country. And uh, please also consider checking out my forthcoming book, which is 50% off in the month of February. Um, it will be printed um, on February 28th. So if you order it before in advance, before it's printed, you can get 50% off with this code over here. Um, and it is called Translanguaging and English as a Lingua Franca in the Plurilingual Classroom. So I've done a study of high school English classrooms, two high school English classrooms in Hawaii, and I've explored how students languages as well as English as a lingua franca, uh, both of those things can be used together um, to create an inclusive and equitable uh, classroom culture. Um, what gives rise to negative or positive feedback loops and how to manage them. And also, finally, 
please check out my blog on bi and multilingual education, which had 16,000 visitors in 2022, um, about 50 to 60 percent of them from the United States and the rest from around the world. I've blogged about critical language awareness, translanguaging and transformative pedagogy, uh, language versus literacy, what every teacher should know is that there are language and literacy practices that are equally skilled as the ones that are valued at school, um, but are not recognized or not even brought up at school. Um, so uh, there's also majoritized and minoritized translanguaging translanguaging, where um, some forms of translanguaging are seen as normal and desirable, like translanguaging between English and the national language, and then translanguaging that's seen as deviant or um, not desirable, for example, translanguaging between um, immigrant languages or stigmatized dialects or indigenous tribal um, languages that are not seen to have a place in, in, in academic institutions. So it's actually not just about um, promoting translanguaging, but promoting minoritized forms of translanguaging. And finally, what do pre-service teachers need to know to teach linguistically diverse classes? Um, based on my personal experience and an excellent study by uh, Birello et al., um, what they found was that pre-service teachers don't just need to value multilingualism, because if they do, they tend to just value their own kinds of privileged multilingualism and not multilingualism as they see it in their students. So what's, what Birello and all are arguing in this um, study I've summarized in this post is for teachers to actually value multilingualism as it manifests itself in their students. So um, I review, uh, actually this year I'm reviewing one excellent book uh, per month um, and the key takeaways from that book on bi and multilingual education, but there's around 50 or 60 posts reviewing different articles about bi and multilingual education that you can assign for course readings and I've tried to make it accessible and uh, engaging to read about. So please do check out my blog as well or these references, these excellent studies that I've um, presented in my literature review or offer a lot of food for thought as well. Um, and thank you. Uh, once again, please feel free to check out my blog and website or email me. I'd be happy to give this talk again or something similar. And thank you very much, Zhang Feng, uh, for this amazing and very privileged opportunity. And thank you, Nasha. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And hello to my parents. Wow. Anna, thank you so much. I, I learned a lot from you. Thank you so much for this inspiring talk. And um, yeah, and would you mind like putting the, the resources that you mentioned in the chat? I, I, sure. I think the audience would love to know that. I personally use your blog in my class <laughs> and I've oh, been yeah. reading your blogs and using them, sharing them with my students in the class. So yeah, I highly recommend uh, Dr. Anna Mendoza's blog and your forthcoming book as well like you can drop the link in the in the chat right uh i'll just uh i'll drop all these uh resources and i'm just uh taking it takes me uh i'm quite fast so i've just taken a screenshot of those last six slides which i'll drop into the chat as i'm answering questions so yeah yeah thank you so much I'm gonna just take a minute, let folks <laughs> digest the, the, the conversation we just listened to. Um, yeah, and feel free to share your thoughts, your questions. We do have one question already in the chat, which uh, uh, I'm gonna read it to you later uh, in a minute. Yeah. Uh, how can I drop it in the chat to everyone? Do I have a, can I drop it? I think so, yeah. Yeah. The flyer, you mean? Uh, the flyer, yeah, I can't seem to I have an put in attachment, but I guess I can I can drop in the um, the links to my blog posts, and I can also drop in the uh, these these links as well. And I will I will have to drop in that Amazon um, the voices because I again want to um, uh, promote that book. Uh, it's it's an excellent anthology um and um i hope it sells many more copies and then uh i'll also um drop in a link to my forthcoming book yeah so i'm i'm happy to take questions as well as i um am no stranger to multitasking 
<laughs> okay, I think uh, I, I do remember, uh, we, we already got one question, I think from Atta. So I'm gonna read it to you, Anna. So we, we have about like 10 minutes for question for Q and A. Uh, so please feel free to type your questions in the chat uh, in the meantime. So I think, uh, so Ada said, thanks Dr. Mendoza for the great and dynamic presentation of the novel ideas on this webinar. I understand CLA is a host to a myriad of concepts in the in language teaching from critical pedagogy to the many concerns in critical uh, applied linguistics. One issue, however, particularly interests me, and this is the one related related to race and anti-racist pedagogy. So in your opinion, and according to your research, how can language teachers or researchers for that matter, raise awareness about this and what we can do to teach pluralism when it comes to race and how can we teach and increase tolerance in the minds of our learners? Uh, thank you, Atta, for that question. Um, I'm aware that uh, raciolinguistics, uh, Flores, um, for example, the work of Nelson Flores, is uh, another important part uh, of this discussion. So um, I'm, uh, I'm coming from um, the Canadian context, um, so where uh, the, uh, for us, what we've often noticed, uh, at least um, in in my in my in my country or the country where I grew up, is that um, well there was my timer, um, is that instead of being explicitly racist, people use language or discourses about language as a proxy for race. So Rio Kubota has done some work on this. So for example, they say students who speak blah as the first language, but actually they mean. Uh, Asian immigrants, right? But it's it's very rude to directly talk about race, so they use also um, language as a kind of labeling to to do racial labeling without doing overt racial labeling. So for me, um, what I know about um, the concerns of race and anti-racist pedagogy is coming from that that personal experience growing up in Canada, where where language and race, um, linguistic ideologies and racial ideologies are, are deeply intertwined. So when I'm talking about linguistic discrimination, I'm actually um, talking also uh, at the same time inseparably about racial discrimination. But I'm sure that there are scholars who have dealt more explicitly and with a focus on race, um, and that would include our third speaker, for example, in this series, um, where I hope to, I will also, um, I also intend to attend her presentation, um, all the presentations that um, I am able to attend so that um, I too can learn more about um, explicit discussions of race and connecting um, those theories and that intellectual history to critical language awareness. Oh, Zhang Feng, can I can I hear? I'm sorry. I oh, can't sorry, hear. I I, yeah. <laughs> I muted myself. Um, so we we also got a second question. I think from Guy Rowland. Uh, I think so. Uh, so do you subscribe to Catherine Jenkins' theory of English as a multilingual friend? Uh, oh, so uh, Catherine uh, Jenkins' theory of English as a multilingual lingua franca. So, uh, actually, to be honest, this is um, this is my first, the first time I've heard of this theory. I know Jenkins is an English as a lingua franca scholar, so um, I I don't know if I subscribe because this is the first time I've I've heard about it. So, if if um, the person could explain a little bit what what that is. And someone's also suggested other work by April Baker Bell. So thank you for these for these uh, resources. I will um, I will save this page and uh, Jenkins so Jenkins multilingual lingua franca. Could you uh, explain a little bit about um, what that uh, theory is? Can I speak or should I type it? Uh, sure, speaking, you can maybe. speak. You can speak. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So I'm actually writing my master's on uh, English as lingua franca, and I uh, was looking at this uh, theory, this model where uh, when people communicate with English with English uh, as a lingua franca, 
They also use uh, their own language and other languages. Uh, so it should be referred to, uh, she believes from now on as a multilingual Franca, because when people use English, they're not just using English, they're using other languages as well. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so it's it actually that's how it ties in with with translanguaging and English as a lingua franca. Yeah. So um, it is a relevant, very relevant question. So um, the way I actually would say I, I would think about it a little bit differently, because I, um, I, I would be um, cautious about mixing other languages with English and saying it's just this one melting pot of languages and that is their lingua franca because there's a lot of, um, uh, um, not always, but uh, sometimes there's a lot of attention to distinct languages in that melting pot. So if you use a little bit of stylization of Chinese that indicates a certain identity, if you lose, if you if you start speaking Filipino mid-sentence, that means something socially. So I would be cautious about saying that their shared lingua franca is a multilingual English. Um, I would say instead that every single person in that context has a unique plurilingual repertoire with strengths and vulnerabilities. So even though they're communicating in what looks like as a group on the group level, a multilingual English as a lingua franca, there's different resources at play that different people have more or less authority over. And um, definitely that there are, you, that's why you need to, we need to pay attention to those feedback loops and positionings. But thank you, I would, I would definitely um, um, see, um, now I would like to talk, look at Jenkins's work and see if she, if she um, takes those, those, uh, those differences, I guess, um, into account. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. If folks have, or you can feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself to ask the question directly in instead of typing it in the chat box. Yeah. Good questions. Well, thank you for these resources. <laughs> Oh, there is the Critical Language Awareness uh, Collective. So, um, wow, um, Shauna, um, if I can ask, um, what uh, this is the first time I've seen this website. Wow, um, where where is it? Where are you based? <laughs> I hope you don't mind my throwing it in there. Um, yeah. So I tend to work across TESOL and writing composition studies. And so I've been doing more presentations on the writing composition side. But so um, I've been building this uh, email list, the CLA Collective for teachers uh, and researchers interested in critical language awareness pedagogy, especially as it relates to writing and literacy instruction. Um, it includes people who do Spanish as a heritage language. We don't have as many multi and bilingual, and I'm realizing I have not posted things on this particular interest section list, and I will start doing more of that. But if anyone wants to know more, you can sign up for the email list there, or I'll put my email in the chat. Um, so again, especially in terms of how this applies to the teaching of writing and literacy, which is often where some of these tensions around standardized language really mm -hmm. come to head with the expectations of what students right. are expected to do, et cetera. So I don't want to I don't want to take any, you're doing such amazing work and I don't want to take anything away, but I thought I would just throw it in there. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you're absolutely right that that this is the domain where it come it, it meets the most resistance. So any resources in this domain would be would be very, very helpful. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you for sharing those. Not relevant, but I just wanted to say, someone said, I feel sorry even more. I missed the deadline for the MA TESOL at the University of Illinois under banish of pain. Why don't you apply next year? We have a full funding package. Thank you for the resources, um, Ada, uh, Shauna, and um, yeah, thank you. I, I have saved those. Could you share? Oh yes, um, Catherine's theory, please. Yes, I should. Um, I should look more into uh, yeah, uh, English as a lingua franca. My my um, my work there actually draws more on Friedrich and and Matsuda because it's interactional. It's it's um, interactional sociolinguistics. But anyway, uh, that aside, thank you for the reading suggestions, folks. And uh, once again, thank you so much for coming.
Yeah, okay. So then I will do my job to conclude uh, the webinar. So uh, so before I wrap up the webinar, I just want to share. So I invite all of you to attend our next webinar in this series. Dr. Paul Megan Cipolo uh, uh, will talk about addressing colonial lingualism in TESO, raising critical language awareness through trans-epistemic education on February 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So you can scan the QR code or click on the link to register this webinar. And I can throw drop off the link in the chat later. And lastly, thank you all for being here today. If you'd like to join the BMAS team, you are welcome to email me or Nashia. We are looking for new members to join our leadership team. And if you'd like to stay in touch, we invite you to follow, on, follow our Twitter or join our online forum. Thank you all. Um, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>